the environmental movement has presented a very negative vision of what we need to do, and it's always the things that we have to stop doing. But I think the other side of that coin is that we can really improve our quality of life if we do things differently. Robert Costanza is one of the founders of the field of ecological economics. It's not um, in any way assured that the future will be sustainable and desirable. Uh, but unless we focus on trying to create that future, we will, we will obviously never, never have it. Uh, so we don't know what's really possible, and we won't know what's possible until, we, until we've tried. We don't want to sustain something that's bad. Uh, on the other hand, we don't want to have something that's desirable that doesn't last. Uh, so we want something that really is, is both of those things, that we can sustain into the future but also is, is desirable. And I think our current system is, is neither of those things. It's neither sustainable or desirable. Uh, and so we need to, to uh, create a new economy, a new, uh, a new system that, uh, that can sustain itself, um, that can... Uh, maintain, that can prevent uh, damaging the ecological life support system beyond its ability to repair itself, and yet can allow human, f human flourishing, human prosperity uh, within those biophysical constraints. And, uh, you know, history has shown that uh, the best way to achieve positive results is to first envision them. You have to create a positive vision in order to have any chance of, of achieving it. So if we, if we remain mired in pessimism and defeatism, uh, then we will be defeated. Uh, but if we create a positive vision and say, here's what we really want, then, then at least we have the possibility of finding the path uh, to, to get us there. And I think positive visions are much more motivating for people than, than negative visions. I think that's been part of the problem with the environmental movement, that negative visions are not motivating in the end. Uh, they can help to solve uh, immediate problems, you know, to stop doing something that's really bad right now. Uh, but <clears throat> they can't help to, to solve the larger term, longer term kinds of problems of how do we really uh, change our society in order to achieve these, these goals. A democratic society needs to create a shared vision of where it wants to go, what, what the goals are. I think we've ignored that part of it, you know, since the Founding Fathers came up with our original vision. And we don't live in an empty world anymore, which was the situation uh, in 1776 when we had a lot of frontier. And when natural capital and social capital were not the limiting factors. Uh, so we need to re-envision, you know, uh, what our goals are uh, in this new context. And in fact, that process of envisioning needs to be an ongoing process. I think we have the technology now to actually begin to start to do that. You know, we have a, a global conversation in real time is actually possible for the first time in human history. So there's a lot of interesting psychological research recently about the, the psychology of happiness, the science of happiness, what actually does contribute to people's sense of well-being. And what they're finding very clearly is that um, material consumption only contributes up to a certain fairly low threshold. And beyond that, it's other things. It's your interactions with your friends and family. It's your interactions with nature. Uh, that, that contribute to uh, increasing your well-being. And in fact, studies show that uh, people who are more materialistically oriented actually suffer from higher rates of both mental and physical illness. So it's not making people better off uh, to consume more, even though that's the message we're getting from, from advertising you know, on a daily basis, a barrage of, of the message that you know, if you consume a certain product, you'll be happier. Uh, in fact, the reality is, is, uh, is just the reverse. Uh, that the more we focus on those material consumption uh, kinds of options for improving happiness, the, the worse off we are. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a real balance here. Uh, you know, you need a certain amount of material consumption to survive. You need food. You need, we need transportation. We need all of those things. Uh, but I think we focus far too much on that aspect of our, the contributions to, to well-being, and we need to create a, a better balance, uh, you know, among the various things that do contribute to our well-being. The transition from the current system to a more sustainable, positive future will be difficult but not impossible. We have a lot invested in the current system, uh, and making the transition to some other system then requires uh, more than just, you know, wanting to do it, more than just uh, uh, because there's a lot of uh, inertia and, and investment to overcome. One of the lessons, I think, from that is that the worst thing you can do uh, when, when tr trying to help an addict overcome their addiction is tell them that they're doing the wrong thing and they're, you know, they have to stop and, 
uh, you know, uh, that immediately causes a defensive reaction. And I think that's exactly what we've done with the environmental message, uh, particularly climate change, you know, that this is something that's, that's wrong and we have to stop and we have to, you know, reduce our consumption, et cetera. But that's the, I think, the, the wrong way to frame it. Because one way to overcome that is to say, here's, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's, you're not doing the wrong thing, uh, but here's something better uh, that, that, uh, that we could be doing that would improve the situation. And unless you have that positive vision out there uh, for what would happen after the addiction is overcome, then it's very difficult to get any movement at all. Professor Costanza is founder and editor-in-chief of the journal Solutions. Solutions encourages dialogue and consensus building to solve environmental, social, and political problems. We created a, uh, a new journal slash website um, that's called Solutions that's focused on building the shared vision, on having a discussion, uh, a dialogue uh, about what those integrated solutions might be. And, the, and all solutions really affect many parts of life. You can't just have a technical solution that's going to going to solve a problem without having other, other impacts. So we need to think about how these things are interconnected and uh, what real solutions might be and what our, real, what our goals are. Peter Victor has an interesting book out called Managing Without Growth, and he asked just this question, what would a sustainable economy look like? Could we have a, an economy that was not growing in GDP terms, but that was actually improving in, in quality of life terms? And uh, he, he lists a number of policies that would be required to achieve that. It is possible. Uh, <clears throat> and in order to achieve it, it would require um, uh, fewer working hours uh, per person. Uh, so there would be more leisure time. That more leisure time could be used to interact with family and friends and, and Im improve uh, social capital. It would, it would involve a stabilization of um, population and uh, an investment shifting away from consumption goods and towards public goods. So we need to shift away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. We need to have more efficient transportation systems, et cetera. Uh, there's a long list there. Uh, but it also involves investing in our, um, our human capital infrastructure. Uh, so investing in education, investing in healthcare, investing in population stabilization. That would mean reducing the gap in income. Uh, and um, invest in rewarding people for, for participating in, uh, in, uh, in, their, in their societies, in their communities. I think we're going to need everyone to change the world, <laughs> not just people uh, from environmental schools, but I think we need, we need also to change the minds and the approach and the vision of people you know, that are studying in, in uh, MBA programs and, and, uh, and all across the whole spectrum in, uh, in academia. And I think that's one of the problems uh, itself is the isolation of the different academic disciplines and the lack of sort of uh, cross um, uh, of dialogue. Um, so, you know, how do we overcome that that constraint in uh, in academia? Transcending disciplinary boundaries, I think, is a real is a real key. Now, what that's one thing that I think environmental schools can lead the way in, and and are very much doing that. Uh, so it's not so much the environment as a specific discipline of study, but as a, a way to bridge across, uh, you know, all of the various aspects of, of human knowledge and pull, pull all that together and get this discussion and dialogue going to actually solve problems. For more information on the Visions of a Sustainable World project, please visit environment.yale.edu forward slash visions.